Welcome to News 24's election coverage for 2019. Great excitement everywhere in the country uh, about what might happen on the 8th of May. And I'm joined in our Auckland Park studios by News 24's elections analyst, Davi Scholes. Davi, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Let's talk about the Democratic Alliance. The opposition, the official opposition in Parliament, have been since 1999, have shown strong growth in every election since mm -hmm. 1994, in fact, when it was a tiny party commanding 1.7%, if I'm not, uh, not mistaken, yeah. uh, as it were, uh, growing uh, to take over the mantle of official opposition in 1999, uh, and then growing even further still in 2004 and 2009, 2016, uh, under the leadership of Tony Leon, Helen Zeller, and now Musi Maimane, who will face his first general election as, as leader of the party. What do you make of the DA's gradual pr progression from a tiny party in Parliament to the 22% party that we see now? Yeah, so, so I've analysed the, the demographics of the DA support for a long time now, and it's been a, an interesting journey. Um, the party started early on um, essentially um, gathering up all the minority votes in the country, right? And, and steadily but surely building a diverse coalition mm. of, of minority voters. Um, and then towards the kind of end of the 2000s, and I think particularly with the 2011 um, local government election, made their first big breakthrough into the black electorate, getting five or six percent of the of the black vote nationally in 2011. And I think ever since then, the party's been facing this strategic dilemma of how to grow in the black electorate, which is obviously its key strategic imperative. Mm -hmm. That's the only place left to grow for the party. Um, and if they ever wanted to remove the ANC from government, that's what they would have yes. to do. Um, while simultaneously maintaining their, the, the base that they have, um, getting the base that they have to turn out, um, and remaining ideologically coherent mm -hmm. um, in trying to communicate um, to a very diverse swath of South Africans um, and trying to unite them behind a single vision. It's a very complex task. Um, and I think it's, in a way, um, electorally the most complex task of all the major parties. Um, the ANC has a relatively coherent uh, simplistic base that they mm. need to appeal to, so does the EFF, but the DA actually has a lot of different kinds of voters that they need to appeal to and that they need to turn out and that they need to, to you know, maintain. Mm. Um, and I think that that brings a certain level of complexity. Um, having said that, I also think they've had an awful year or two, right? 20, 2017 and 2018 were difficult years for the DA, given what happened in Cape yeah, Town, yeah. Um, given you know, some of the difficult contextual elements. Um, I think 2019, the campaign has gone relatively well. Um, We'll see on the 8th of May exactly how well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's it's been a, a tough context um, with a little bit of a better closing for the DA, um, and uh, only the 8th of May will will tell. Good bird's eye view, Darby. Uh, the, the DA took over uh, the leadership or uh, managed to cobble together a coalition in the city of Cape Town in 2006, then expanded its governance uh, footprint to the Western Cape Provincial Government. And then to 2016, the local government elections was quite a turning point for the DA, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And the, I think the one really interesting phenomenon about the DA's experience in the Western Cape was they managed about 42% or something of the vote in 2006 in Cape Town. And then once they got into government, they very rapidly grew their vote, mm. both in Cape Town, and then immediately after that in the sort of municipalities around Cape Town, and then immediately after that all of the Western Cape. Why is that? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think a part of it is demographic. It's simply that the Western Cape has the demographics for them to be able to do that. There's a, a large number of colored voters who had previously been ANC voters. And I think as the trend started changing in Cape Town, it shifted throughout the rest of the province. Um, I think DA spokespersons would argue that people saw great DA governance mm. in the Western Cape mm. or in Cape Town and then decided to back the DA in, in, in growing numbers. I leave it up to the people of Cape Town to answer that question. But um, the, the important question, I think, for us for Gauteng in 2016 and 2019, though, is whether DA governance in Trane and Johannesburg and now Midval for a while, right, in Gauteng, has had any impact on voters um, in, in, in Gauteng. And I think um, the, the pattern in the Western Cape was the DA started governing and started doing better and better. It will be fascinating to see on election night whether that same pattern holds um, in Gauteng. And I'm going to be looking very, very closely at places like Alexandra, like Deep Slurt, mm -hmm. like Soweto, Mamelodi, Atridgeville, to see whether the DA has made inroads in those townships where they're now governed for the first time. Yes. Because remember, for a long time, the ANC message in places like those were that the DA would take social, take social grants yes. away, wouldn't deliver things for poor people, for people of color. Um, and now the DA has had a chance to govern then. People there have had a chance to experience DA governance. And it will be very interesting to see if it's had at all implications. Because that then will tell us if their successes in the Western Cape were purely based on demographics or whether, it did, or whether good governance, as they claim it did, 
did have impact on the electorate. I guess, and the other question is whether they've actually governed well in, in Gauteng. Mm. Um, so I live in a suburb and the suburb seems fine. I'm not quite sure how well things have gone in Soweto or mm. Atwijville or Mamelodi. Um, mm. And I guess those voters will pass verdict on that. Uh, Davi, uh, the 2016 municipal election, uh, it kind of uh, caught the DA off guard. The, the, the poor performance of the ANC, I think it caught everyone off guard. Yeah. Um, the, the, the ANC lost Twane, the control of the city of Twane, the control of the city of Johannesburg, and control of the city of Nelson Mandela Bay. Um, how do you think they've gone, the DA in those uh, municipalities? It's been two years. Yeah. Uh, they've obviously inherited some councils in strife. Yeah. Um, will they be held accountable for the way in which they govern in those cities? So I, I, let's just, I want to answer the first implicit question that you just mentioned, which is exactly how well they did in 2016. And I think it's worth saying that the DA had an absolutely incredible, historically successful mm -hmm. election in 2016 mm -hmm. for two reasons. The one reason is that they got absolutely explosive turnout from their base. Um, and that's why they were able to win to a large extent Strane, um, Nelson Mandela Bay and Johannesburg. Um, you know, that the base turned out at something like 71% of, of town or of, of suburbs turned out in Gauteng, but only 53% of townships turned out. So when you get a, a big turnout... So it was a perfect storm for both parties, wasn't exactly. it? Exactly. So really, really high DA base turnout and relatively low ANC base turnout, and that drove their support. So, which is kudos for a party if they're able to turn out their base in that way, and I think it'll be an important strategic imperative for them to do so in this election as well. But the other critical thing is that the DA made historic inroads in the black electorate, particularly in Gauteng mm. in 2016. So they were in places like Sushanguwe, they were getting 13 or 14 percent of the black vote, whereas, you know, like, uh, like in 2014, they were getting five or six percent of the black mm. vote in that era. Um, so that those sorts of inroads pushed the ANC down and the DA up. Um, and I think that now the next part of the question was, so how have they gone? Um, you know, I think I think the the, the coverage has been um, has been muddled, right? There's some you get some good news stories and you get some bad news stories. Um, but the one thing that's true is they have gotten a lot of coverage, a lot of yes. media coverage yeah. about governing in Gauteng. Mm. Um, and uh, to my mind, I think it, they they stand to benefit from being positioned as a party that governs. They still have um, a very slick media operation, don't they? I mean, they, they know do. how to get the message out. But it, it, I think at the end of the day, though, it, the the thing that really matters is at the coal face of delivery, do people mm. actually experience improvements in their lives? Mm. Are there fewer mm. potholes? Are there more houses being built? Are the lights on? Uh, does the water run? Is my street safe? Mm. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, uh, we'll have to see on the 8th of May, and it will show in places like Soweto, Atridgeville, Alex, Deepsworth, etc. Davi, uh, in, in the beginning of our, of our conversation, you spoke about the complexity of the DA's task mm -hmm. to unite a disparate group of supporters around a single vision, um, uh, whilst also taking into account demographics and the urgency to grow the party amongst black voters. Talk to us about black voters. Um, your experience uh, of our electoral politics, of the DA's progression since 1994, how difficult was it for the DA to break into the black market? And can we safely say that they've already done that? I think we can safely say they've already done it. Um, you know, they won, I think, nationally seven or eight percent of the black vote in 2016, um, which is a lot. I mean, it's not a massive number, right? But it, it is an historically high number for the for the DA, and um, I think it's enough to be called a foothold, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, the critical question is whether they can now use that foothold to catapult to a higher um, higher number, whilst simultaneously holding on to their the rest of their base, right? Because I think the one thing we haven't discussed about the DA is that they're facing some serious threats. Um, on their right flank yes. um, from other smaller parties like the Capitalist Party of South Africa, like particularly the Freedom Front Plus, possibly from good in the Western Cape. Um, so the, I think the DA's math in this election will be a little bit complicated in mm. that they're probably going to continue doing a little bit better with black voters. That's what the polling suggests. That's what the by-election suggests. But possibly a little bit worse with minority voters mm. who are maybe a little bit turned off by the more social democratic message of the DA. Um, and so my anticipation is that they'll end up somewhere close to 2014, probably a little bit better given what we saw in 2016, but that the way they build the math to that point changes. So it's a little bit less white, a little bit less colored, a little bit more black, basically. Mm. Um, but still getting them to 22 or 23 or 24. Um, so, the, and, and I think the way that they manage this transition will be very interesting and the way that they um, manage to maintain the base and the extent to which they maintain their base um, will be very, very interesting. So um, I think 
you know, it'll be interesting to look at conservative Afrikaans areas like Mughale City in the West Rand of Gauteng, like certain sections of Pretoria where we know there are quite conservative Afrikaans yes. voters, whether those voters will actually come out and vote DA again or whether they're thinking about voting Freedom Front Plus or just staying yeah, away. Yeah. Um, that will be a very important uh, variable in the DA's math for this election. Uh, you spoke of 23-24%. Of course, yeah. they got 22% during the yeah. last election. Uh, would that be the high point for them? Would, would that con uh, constitute a successful election? Uh, campaign for them. What would constitute a, 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 a disappointing election? I campaign? think anything under 22 would be very problematic for them, and particularly problematic for the leadership. Right? Mm -hmm. um, it, I mean, if you think about it, Helen Ziller in 2014 got 22 percent mm -hmm. from 16. The from previous election. Exactly. Um, if Musi Maimane in 2019, five years later, mm -hmm. with an intense amount of campaigning mm -hmm. with governments in Gauteng and for a period in Nelson Mandela Bay with just a larger, better resourced party is exactly. not able to crack 22%, then I think that there will be a serious discussion in the party about the, the way forward. I don't know how that mm. would play out, but I think 22 is the absolute minimum. Um, my feeling is that something like 23 or 24, which is likely, um, the party won't be overjoyed by it, mm. but mm. they would have felt that, you know, we had, well, they had a really tough uh, 2018. Yes. Um, and 23, 24 would maybe be enough for them to say, you know, we kind of salvaged yeah. a, tough, a tough context for the, the, this election. Onwards to 2021, where the, um, the ground will be more fertile, yeah. a, a local government election. Especially given the growth from 12 to 16 to 22. I mean, it was exponential growth yeah. in three successive elections. Yeah. And look, I, I think we should also not, you know, discard the outside possibility that they could have a completely awful election. Mm. Um, that mm. could be 18 or 19, which mm. would be totally disastrous. And mm. um, there have been some polls that suggest that. Mm. I don't expect that. I don't think that would be the case. But, uh, you know, Ipsos, for example, has it at 18%. Uh, Ipsos is a credible pollster. I disagree. But um, if they happen to get 18%, I think it will be, um, uh, you know, it'll be kind of an earthquake for yeah. the party. Um, and then there will be very serious consequences internally. Davi, in closing, if you were Musi Maumane going to bed on the 7th of May, the night before the election, what would keep you awake? If I anything. <laughs> I don't think I'll be able to sleep. Um, no, I think, I think the... I think the basis, the level that base DA voters are going to turn out at will be mm. a critical concern for me. Um, so uh, if you are a former or a DA voter, you're probably going to get some SMSs on mm. election day mm. because I think the party is really nervous about that topic. Yeah. Um, the extent to which the, the DA base sticks with the DA and with Musi is a critical question. Um, and then I think the, what I feel a little bit better about if I were him is there probably will be further inroads in the black electorate. The question is just exactly how much. Um, and then ultimately whether they'll reach kind of 23, 24, more than 22. And we haven't discussed Gauteng, but just final note, um, I do think you'll go to bed somewhat excited about what mm. could happen in Gauteng. It's not a, a done deal at all, but I think there's a distinct possibility that they could drive the ANC under 50 in Gauteng, which is another minor proxy for success, I think, for the DA in this election. Thank you, Darby. Darby Skolz, our resident uh, elections analyst, he will be joining us at the Results Operational Center in Pretoria uh, during the week of the 8th of May. Follow all our elections coverage on news24.com.